Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, as we like to do on Mondays, we like to talk about upstream projects and new ideas and new technologies. Um, and today, we're really happy to have Adele Zaluk with us, who is a product manager in the OpenShift group at Red Hat. Um, and he's going to talk about some emerging multi-cluster patterns. Um, you've probably heard about Kubernetes control planes and other things along that line that have been being um, talked about and discussed in different uh, community groups. Um, but this today is uh, Adele's take on it, and I'm really looking forward to it. So Adele, introduce yourself, your background a little bit, and then take us down this path. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Adel Zaluk, and um, I'm a product manager for um, OpenShift. Um, I have, like, my experience is a, is a mixture between um, uh, networking, uh, consulting, and development, um, <clears throat> and research and recently product management. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, multi-cluster patterns. And as you see here, the subtitle is a bit um, uh, confusing, but I'm going to be explaining it along the way, which is a path to virtual dualistic, logically centralized, physically distributed clusters. Um, and I would like to start by uh, having us look at this, um, uh, this figure. Um, the way, and given also my background, I come from networking. So um, the first thing I wanted to do is, or thought of doing is basically mapping um, the stack that we have with OpenShift onto something like an OSI model. And that turned out to be the OpenShift interconnection model. That, that does not exist anywhere. That is something I came up with. So I'm sorry for the OSI <laughs> folks. Uh, but yeah, that's that's um, that basically, the reason I actually did that is because I, OSI is a representation of uh, layers of what they do, and then there are protocols that are basically interconnecting with one another at different layers of the stack. And there are even specialized stacks like the TCP IP model that kinds of like, for example, you could have an application that would run on UDP or an application that would run on TCP, and then there's IP on the layer three layer. Um, and, uh, and then there's a physical layer that everything runs on top. I think of OpenShift or the stack that we provide is basically similar. Um, Red Hat has been historically known for Red Hat Linux. That's the base where we build on top of everything. Um, and then OpenShift is just an addition that brings all the goodies uh, of upstream Kubernetes um, to, 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 to customers and, and, and to you. Um, and this is, con this is basically comes in different shapes, forms, and layers. Um, if we think about Kubernetes, you'll find a lot of cluster interfaces uh, being defined upstream. Initially, Kubernetes didn't have that, but the more it gets, uh, or the more we, we, we go with time, the more, more standards get defined, um, like cluster API, which deals more of how machines get, gets created on a cluster level on any infrastructure provider, like CNI, um, uh, deals with the networking on the cluster, um, like um, container runtime interface, which deals of, of basically what you use as a runtime to run your workloads, whether that is normal or sandboxed um, or, or um, any other type of runtime that you choose, or the CSI layer, which basically consists of plugins and so on. I don't have time to talk about each of these layers in details, but I can tell you that like was 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 with Kubernetes did a lot of these and each layer can span an entire session on its own. And with OpenShift, basically we, we bring that um, um, with support and um, add on top a lot of layers that help uh, the usability of these things. Um, then we go a layer up and then we have modes of operation for OpenShift clusters. Um, we have, for example, self-managed or managed. You can run your clusters in a connected mode or a disconnected. You have a standalone version of it. You have an external control plane. That's basically what we're going to a bit explain about today, which is a more an architectural pattern, but still bringing OpenShift. Um, and and so that choice brings you more and more um, uh, use cases. So um, and and then we go a layer up, and then you have the multi-cluster management and orchestration. There's a lot of things happening here. And I am sure I forgot many things to add here, but I was lazy at some point and I didn't add. Um, things like image, res image registries, uh, Git ops, pipelines, all these things fits as blocks. And the nice thing is we provide this as 
choices, right? Like we could say it depends on the use case. We have the luxury to say it depends because we have these blocks that could interconnect with one another in any way, shape or form, right? And this is, in my opinion, the real value that we provide these building blocks <clears throat> and you come and, and, and look at them and say, oh, this makes sense. Um, I have this use case and I would like to, you know, this, this, I would like to apply, for example, policy or run a multi-cluster with a disconnected cluster and, and, and run it in, in an externalized control plane. So you have, you can use it in the same way that the OSI model is built for or networking protocols basically that match and run on top of one another. Um, and in this session today, I'm gonna be focusing only on three blocks spanning two layers. Um, so let's, let's, let's start. Um, yeah. As I said, the, the term or what was a bit complicated was virtual, logically centralized, dualistic, physically distributed. I'm going to go and try to, to, to explain what I mean by each of these, who so bears me. Um, so the first layer, I'm gonna start from the top, which is I'm gonna take part of the multi-cluster management story, right? A very small part of it, not all the blocks. And I'm gonna talk about KCP, right? And KCP to me represents these um, two clusters, two, two blocks on the top. It could present more, but I'm going to be talking only about the two blocks today, uh, which is basically, if you look at the GitHub repo for KCP, you're gonna find it is defined as a minimum Kubernetes API server. It exposes just enough resources and it extends or makes the API server pluggable enough so that you can also define or get rid of the resources that you don't need. Um, in addition, if you look at the documentation, you're gonna find three major use cases that KCP tries to address. The first one is that minimalistic API server that gives you that not normal, like if you look at the Kubernetes API server, you're gonna find a ton of resources. You don't necessarily need all these. Um, so it strips out all the things that is needed um, only the ones that are needed and provides you with an interface that you can interact with it without all the overhead of Kubernetes, like components, uh, like keep control manager, or any of these things that deals with pod or deployments and all these things. In KCP, you could choose to not have pods even as an understandable resource. And the second thing is more about um, multi-tenancy. So the way multi-tenancy has been presented so far was with the use of our backend namespaces. But what if the, the, the question that gets asked is what if we can present that and take, take it a layer up and, and make each cluster present a tenant, for example, and then orchestrate multi-tenancy on a cluster level primitives instead of like namespaces, which present, presents a stronger bubble, which might be appealing to, uh, to some. And then the third um, uh, one is transparent multi-cluster. And the argument here is like whatever you wanna apply, um, um, to a cluster should also work with KCP. KCP presents one layer on top. You could attach multiple children clusters to KCP. So whatever gets deployed on KCP layer should not be problematic or should not, it should not be a problem to propagate that resource that you just deployed to the children clusters. Um, that's basically transparency. Also, I, I like to call it lossless multi-cluster because whatever you apply on the top layer doesn't lose value or entropy when it gets translated onto these children clusters. Um, yeah, and so there is also the stack, the Slack channel for KCP, if you wanna have, like, get more details. Um, I think Clayton, Jason, and David give um, a lot of, or talk a lot about a lot of topics that I just mentioned here and go into the details of how things would look like in the future. So if you're interested, go and join that Slack channel on the Kubernetes Slack and join the discussions. They have also a community meeting. So please, you know, just if you have any questions or things, just go um, and join that uh, in that Slack channel. <clears throat> yeah. So the second part that I would like to, to talk about today, I'm not going to get into the, 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 the weeds of HyperShift, but I just want to present, because I'm, I'm going to present a use case that is actually more generic and can be used uh, by other products, not necessarily, or other projects. It's a pattern more than I'm presenting a product. Um, HyperShift deploys OpenShift, but it deploys it with a slightly different architectural pattern. So that's the dualism here. 
And um, the dualistic part is, you know, who's in philosophy, dualism is basically you could have the mind and the body residing in different places yet functioning, right? So could we do that? Could we take out the mind of OpenShift and put it in somewhere else and still have a functioning cluster? Uh, basically the question that we ask in HyperShift, and yes, it is possible. So you could take the control plane, the logic of that cluster and deploy it somewhere else. Um, not even, not, not only that, but you could also centralize that. So you could have multiple minds of different people work together or under the same um, uh, body and have that, and, and we call that a management cluster. So you could have one management cluster that hosts the logic of all these control um, or all these clusters um, or the control panes on the same place. And the physical distribution is basically you could have your nodes physically distributed across regions, across zones, across cloud providers, it doesn't really matter. Um, so you would get then the virtual part and the dualistic part and the logical centralization by centralizing the control plane of different cluster, separating that from, from the normal um, uh, way of deployment that we use so far. Earlier in this course to respond. Sorry, did I get a question or? No, go on. It was just a, a unmuted something. <laughs> okay, no worries. I thought someone is asking a question. Um, yeah, so with the normal OpenShift, you, you, you have your nodes, you're requiring a certain minimum number of nodes, which needs to be, or in most of the cases, co-located with the control, with the workers. In HyperShift, uh, we're removing that requirement of multiple nodes, and potentially we could host more than one logic, more than one mind, more than one control plane, on the same node and uh, scale that up or down and use all the Kubernetes primitives to do so. <clears throat> so that the HyperShift repo is upstream and it's open source. Um, you could go um, to GitHub and, and also raise issues and try it out. And yeah, it's still early, very early in the early phases. Um, so it's a good time to, to ask questions and, and challenge stuff. Um, why would we want a dualistic or um, um, separate control plane? Okay, included here a set of some, some advantages or features. Um, one thing is because we are getting rid of the, or not getting rid, we're, we're um, complementing the requirement that, so you, some, some customers, some users want that co-location. They don't want dualism. They say, no, I want my mind and body in the same place. I don't want to go and like, be like a freak. Um, um, while others see the benefits of having mine separated. So we provide with OpenShift the two flavors. Uh, when we deploy with HyperShift, you get immediate clusters because you um, don't have to comply with a requirement of a minimum number of nodes to get to a cluster. You are running, you, you're running on an existing cluster and you're hosting just the control plane as pods. So you're getting kind of immediate clusters. And the control planes are cheaper because you're you can host now multiple of these control planes instead of on one control plane per three nodes. You could host multiple control planes on potentially one node. <clears throat> um, we're using Kubernetes to host the Kubernetes control plane. So it's Kubernetes and Kubernetes. I can scale up the pods and, and so on. And by the way, the, the pattern of dualism or control plane and uh, workers separated, this is not new. It has been used um, you will find cloud providers and so on using that, but this here is bringing OpenShift. Like it, it applies that to OpenShift, brings you all the benefits that entire stack that I showed you, um, the choice, and brings that to you in that architectural pattern. So it is important to to to, to understand that it's not new, but it's it gives you all these features with OpenShift. <clears throat> um, you could also have. Um, life cycling decoupled because you could upgrade, for example, the management cluster without affecting the workload clusters or the physical node. Um, they could even be on different versions. They could even be on different architectures. Um, you could also have um, your SREs, like focusing instead of like having to, 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 to memorize the cube config of hundreds of clusters, they just have one config and then they can log into or have access if you allow them to to debug the control plane of your cluster um, or if you are the one providing the clusters then you your SREs are having that benefit of surfing 
across control planes and easily detecting a problem because observability becomes easier, logging becomes easier, and all these things become becomes easier. Not to say that it's not possible, it's definitely possible with multi-cluster management, the other blocks that I didn't talk about, but you could also have multi-clusters, centralized logging, centralized monitoring. It's just the footprint that might be you know, a bit um, um, lower. Yeah, cool. So comes the, the part that a bit more um, about the use case. So um, I'm sure that's not a one-to-one -one relationship. I'm sure that it's not only Hypershift that loves KCP. Um, I'm sure KCP has a lot of other use cases. As I said, Hypershift is just the pattern that I'm presenting today. Lots of other controllers could reuse that pattern or maybe build upon that pattern or completely do other patterns. But it's it's kind of like, you know, KCP could love Hypershift, Hypershift could love KCP, other things love KCP. Uh, today, we're going to talk about that relationship of Hypershift and KCP. Okay, so from a higher layer uh, or a higher level, the use case that I would like to present today is more about can we have KCP as the top, although it doesn't need to always be the top layer, but can we have it as a top layer and orchestrate how we want to schedule clusters? So if you remember the figure um, on the right here, the I know the text is not visible, but that block that I'm highlighting was Kubernetes native clusters. And by that, I mean, we want to apply all the Kubernetes concepts, but on a cluster layer. So basically scheduling. I have a pod, I have a scheduler, cube scheduler, cube scheduler schedules a pod. Can I apply that to a cluster? Can I apply auto scaling to a cluster? Um, can I apply um, a lease, like leader election, all these primitives that exist with Kubernetes, we want to take them a notch up and do that with, mo with more um, a multi-cluster with a virtual pane of glass, which is KCP. Um, so KCP would act as the virtual interface to multiple management clusters. And as I said, in Hypershift, the management cluster is the place where you host the control planes of your clusters. So in that case, <clears throat> I have multiple management clusters. These management clusters would act as the ch children clusters. And then KCP is kind of orchestrating the, the placement, for example, or the scheduling of clusters to any of these management clusters so that they can activate upon and create clusters the hypershift way, which is by separating the control plane and the workers. So a bit of an overview about KCP's internals, because that is needed. KCP consists of mainly a KCP server, an API server, that's the minimalistic API server, and optionally, a cluster controller. KCP server could live and survive without the cluster controller. But when you add the cluster controller, you get a lot of benefits, which is the multi-cluster or the Kubernetes native cluster stuff that I talked about. Um, and that cluster controller at the moment has three components, um, a splitter, which is basically taking care of, like when you create a resource, it takes care of making sure it's scheduled or device that resource like a deployment. For example, if I de deploy a deployment and I have a replicas, then I could replicate to different children clusters in a load balanced way. Um, the CRD puller is, for example, whenever I define a CRD in one of the children cluster that gets pulled up to the virtual cluster, so I build awareness of that CRD. And the sinker is basically more an agent that lives on the child cluster to replicate components that I create. I will go into more details in each. And today I'm going to be extending a bit um, the sinker and the cluster controller to kind of match the use case that I have in mind. All right, so um, as I said, that's another view of it. The sinker, the reason it is slashed is because it does not live on the, um, uh, or communicate directly um, to the virtual cluster. It is in the children cluster. So you have, with KCP, you have the virtual cluster or the control center. I call it the control center. It's not really called that, but I call it this. For simplicity and then you with hypershift you have the management cluster and the sinker gets deployed to each management cluster and that becomes the agent that has awareness of resources that gets deployed on the control center on kcp's virtual cluster um and it's the kcp virtual cluster is really lightweight um it is actually so the main the api server 
plus ATD is now a single binary, um, and it's very easy to run it, as I will show later in the demo. <clears throat> um, so the first thing that we want to do is the resources, like uh, like Hypershift defines two resources or defines a cluster by resource name hosted cluster. So if I'm a user and I create a hosted cluster, I would like, for example, KCP or use the splitter pattern to schedule and divide the hosted cluster and place it on the cluster that has more resources, for example. So in that case, a user creates a cluster, the splitter watches, says, huh, let's see, management cluster one doesn't have any resources, management cluster two, ah, it has, I could create there. So this is what I call, or what is usually being called push mode. Why? Because the splitter needs to talk to the management cluster and the splitter has the awareness of budgeting, of resources. In that case, the splitter becomes more or less the scheduler. On the other hand, you could have pull mode, and that is useful in cases of like, let's say I don't have absolute connectivity between the control center and the management cluster. I just want awareness to be one way. In that case, <clears throat> uh, the syncer could then watch resources get getting created on the um, virtual cluster and replicate them locally. In that case, so the, the hosted cluster becomes virtual. This is why it is called virtual hosted cluster here. And then that resource gets replicated locally to the Hypershift operator, which is an operator that takes a hosted cluster and starts creating clusters and namespaces for each cluster. That is pull mode because it's pulling um, the resource instead of being pushed from up. Now, can I use the pull mode to schedule resources for more than one cluster? That's a question I asked myself and the answer is obviously, well, it was not so obvious for me because I have not coded for a long time, but <laughs> when I was coding this, I realized, oh, but then you have a resource that gets deployed on a control center or the virtual cluster, and that is being watched by two management clusters at the same time. So the queue for each has that resource. So it will be created no matter what. So that like you don't have time to decide or schedule stuff. Like thinkers are going to watch and create at the same time. So it's not useful for scheduling one versus the other management cluster. Um, it is, however, useful if you're thinking about HA, where basically you want to make sure that you have the same resource in more than one place. That's a good pattern if you want to do um, um, high availability in, in any, any use case. <clears throat> and then there's a mixture uh, of these two um, approaches. Um, and that's basically the way um, like I, I used it. So um, I use the sinker um, to kind of like be an informant in some form. It tells the, the, the KCP server or the controller manager, uh, it, or it watches the resources on, on the management cluster it is deployed on, and it tells the controller manager or talks to KCP and, 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 and says, hey, the budget for this cluster is, for example, seven. Um, KCP has an own cluster resource, um, so the update actually happens there. Um, and on the same the same side, the management cluster two actually uses the same pattern. Says, I um, I have this budget. I can I have eight namespaces or seven. And then the cluster controller looks at the budget of each and locally because it has access to the local resources. It looks at these and, and finds out which cluster has more budget so that it can create resources. And then it makes a decision. In that case, <clears throat> you see the loop happening here. Um, and you're going to find like for like the decision will say, OK, seven is less than eight. Seven the cluster uh, management cluster one has less namespaces, meaning it has less clusters because in host and hypershift, a cluster gets a namespace. Um, and so it decides to assign uh, management cluster one, for example, as the owner of the cluster resource or the virtual hosted cluster resource that gets deployed. So the syncer again watches and finds that its name got assigned to that resource the same way 
like the scheduler does with the pod. When a pod um, uh, gets deployed, um, uh, the node uh, tells the scheduler, I could host that, um, um, or I could take care of scheduling that pod on my uh, resources. And it's the same way here, the, the, the syncer tells the um, uh, controller manager, I have more resources to schedule that resource. The controller manager decides, assign management cluster one as the owner of that resource. And then the syncer simply just does its job and replicates that resource locally. And from there on, normal operations happen. Basically the hypershift operator would then take that hosted cluster resource that got deployed in that cluster and then does its job to create namespaces. So in that sense, it's it's more or less similar to how Kubernetes does, it, does its things. Um, you could even take that approach and and chart it a bit. So you could have one sinker that covers a region, for example, and then the resources get gets deployed. Now I haven't tried that, and I think this this is worthy of a lot of discussions. But this is this is just an example of one pattern that is enabled. There's a lot of other patterns because KCP gives you that ability with the controller manager plus the minimalistic API server it pulls for CRDs um, and it is um, um, uh, lightweight. So more more of these get gets enabled. So this is this is now the scheduling part and this is what what would be the topic of my demo. There is another uh, use case which is interesting as well which is auto scaling now i said we want to be looking at clusters the same way we look at uh, kubernetes resources so um can i actually auto scale actual clusters um and the answer is yes so for example in that case let's let's go the hosted cluster path again so a user creates a hosted cluster um but then management cluster that is exit there's only one management cluster and it doesn't have resources so it kind of like informs um, um, KCP uh, or the controller manager, and um, it then asks to create <clears throat> um, using hypershift patterns a hosted cluster. And we the difference here is that a hypershift operator would then be deployed on the on the upper layer or the management or the control center, um, and then uh, basically takes care of of, of of auto scaling and creating a new management cluster which then brings us to the original use case uh, because now I have two management clusters. I create a host cluster resource um, and then these two management clusters will report their budgets. The controller manager will act as the scheduler, assigns one of them, and then one uh, of them picks the resource and deploys it. So I know there's many things that might be unclear at the moment. Hopefully the demo will clear stuff a bit. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, that's that's basically the um, the conceptual part. Um, then we could we could jump to the demo unless like maybe we should have questions um, or see if anyone has questions before we get into the demo. Yeah, let's let's see if anyone has any questions. There's a bunch of people in the uh, chat right now, and I haven't I haven't seen anyone post a question yet. So let's give them a minute. If folks have one, let's see. There's a lot in what you've just said, so um, I'm thinking that maybe a demo might be a really great yeah. thing right now. Okay. So why don't you power through that and let's see if we can um, uh, explain a little sure. bit. Sure. Cool. Okay. So um, I have tried to label the panes accordingly to the architecture that I just talked about. They have the KCP server, then you have the controller manager, and then you have the control center, and that's the virtual cluster that we're going to be talking through. And then we have management cluster one and management cluster two. And and simply what management cluster one and management cluster two are kind of clusters. So you see here management cluster one and management cluster two. And I am currently pointed at a KCP cluster. So this is the API server and uh, the controller manager. So if I get API resources, this is something unique that you'll not find anywhere else, you're going to find this only this set of resources. This is this tells you you're in a KCP uh, pointed cluster. Uh, for example, there's no endpoints, there's no endpoint slices, there's like, many things are not there. Only really what is needed as basis and CRDs. And from the CRDs, uh, 
it is important to see hypershift here. So hypershift is a CRD that represents that host of cluster resource that we have talked about. Phi, um, and additionally, there is one namespace, which is also hypershift, where the hypershift resources gets created. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing here um, is the control and manager. And the control and manager is watching for stuff. As you can see here, it's reporting bud budgets for the two clusters. I'm not going to explain that now. Uh, but before that, let me do something that I have not done to make sure that we are. So let's delete that now. That's the sinker. I'm going to delete the sinker from the clusters to make sure that we're seeing the recent, the most recent logs. And by the way, um, K is just uh, kubectl. Just in case I'm lazy, so yeah. Uh, all right, so in management cluster one, we're gonna find that there was a new sinker deployed and management cluster two has also a new sinker. All right, so, and, and now uh, one thing that we need to um, clear is the clusters. So what I have, um, oh, you will not see it from, from okay, because I'm sharing. That's then. Um, so this is this is the, the the resources that I will create. The first one is called cluster. This is a KCP resource, specific resource. So that will get deployed on the control center. It is already deployed, by the way. But I'm just showing it, and the secrets here are fine because this is a, these are kind clusters. I'm gonna lead them after the demo. Um, so you see kind management two and kind management one. These are the two clusters. And what I'm saying here is basically telling KCP, hey, ingest, or I'm defining these two clusters, so be aware of them. That's what this means. Um, cool. And later on, um, I would be creating um, a hosted cluster, and these are just demos. Um, for example, if I look at um, hosted cluster resource, um, ah, the cluster dummy one. I'm just going to find everything. Test, 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 test. But this will be enough to demonstrate the idea. Okay, cool. So back to our um, control view. Um, right. Let's look at the logs of the sinkers. Here it's telling me that it is aware of a hosted cluster and a cluster resources, and it is setting informers, or basically that's the controller pattern, on hypershift clusters and clusters uh, for both the guest and or the or the virtual cluster and the local cluster. And then it set updated budget. What does this mean? It means that it told the virtual control center, how many namespaces it has. That's the definition of a budget here. So here I have, uh, let's see, I have nine, and if I remove the headers, eight. I have eight namespaces in that cluster, and if I repeat the same command, I have also eight namespaces, so the budget should be eight. So the control and manager here, so, okay, management one has eight, the budget is eight for management one, eight namespaces, meaning I have theoretically have eight clusters. Let's let's think of it this way. And management one has also eight clusters. So most of them are now have equal resources. So I could basically choose when I get when I create a hosted cluster resource, I could basically choose um, any, right? So when I create a hosted cluster resource, what I need is on the management clusters, I need a controller, an actual controller, because on the virtual cluster layer. I don't have a controller. I just, like if I, I literally don't have um, any pods. So no actual control happens on the virtual cluster. In this case, it is more a uh, proxy, right? So the, the actual controller will be in hypershift namespace. So that's where the hypershift operator um, uh, basically lives and acts on resources. So now if I go ahead, and create the hosted cluster resource, like one of them. That's the dummy resource again I told you about. So let's create that. And I'm creating that from the control center. So I'm pointing my kubectl 
whatever to the cube config of the virtual cluster. So sample post a cluster dummy one. So that got created. Let's see what happened. Okay, so we see the budget, the controller manager was aware that the budget um, was nine. That means that one of these two clusters schedules the hyper shift um, resource. So in that case, let's get that name. Let's first log, look at the logs of the sinker. What did it say? So the sinker said, <clears throat> has owner annotation. It does not have the owner annotation, but it had the cluster ID. Um, and it updated itself because it's so that it has less, like um, it, it's so its name on the cluster resource. So that's something I forgot to show, sorry. Uh, let's see, so the cluster controller manager will update the hosted cluster resource with the owner. So first it is aware it's taking up the budgets and then it sees which one has less budget. And in that case, both were equal. And it updates the actual resource that wants to be deployed. Um, okay. Script, let's script for ECP. So the owner got updated um, uh, to be management two, not management one. So I should not find the namespace here. Uh, I should find it on management two. See, there were no cluster namespace, only the hypershift namespace. But here, if I look, look at the namespaces, I should expect, yes. So there was an additional namespace that got created that should represent the cluster. And if I look at the thinker logs, say, oh, looks like I'm the cluster guardian provisioning in a second. So it recognized that it is the owner of this um, by looking at the watching the cluster resource, the hosted cluster resource cluster, and started replicating that to the local cluster for the hypershift operated to act upon. So, um, yeah, if I look at the namespaces, as I said, hypershift example, and um, in a nice or in a, in a beautiful world, hypershift, so here I'm not planning to demo hypershift, but hypershift, um, the namespace here is empty because I literally didn't um, define anything in the resource, so nothing got scheduled, right? Um, but, it provisioned the namespace, which represents a cluster. And usually, if, if we're demoing Hypershift, that cluster for the namespace would contain the control plane of these uh, components. Um, so yeah, if I now create a new resource, like now because it shows management two, because management one and two have equal budgets. They both had eight namespaces, so I choose randomly. Now I create another one. Example. Host a cluster dummy. I would expect that it gets deployed to one because one had less namespaces, meaning less clusters. So it could accustom for more resources. So check again. Nothing got so this is this is all three minutes ago. I get check again. 18 um, seconds. So that the cluster got scheduled to the management cluster that had more or had less namespaces and thus more resources. Um, so that basically just shows that with minimal effort, I was able to apply scheduling mechanisms and scheduling primitives at the cluster layer. And I could do a lot more. Uh, I could do auto scaling, I could do any, basically anything then. And I said the relationship between KCP and Hypershift is not one to one. And the reason I haven't shown anything related to Hypershift is because this is more of a pattern. Any controller could literally just use the same thing that I did here. So you could apply, for example, a, I don't know, um, a, an etcd um, a resource that follows the same pattern and gets scheduled to the cluster that has the controllers in the back end. So scheduling at a cluster layer. And yeah, that, that's basically the, the demo. Yeah, so I think now we could try to take questions. <laughs> All right. Well, we have one question um, from Michael is asking if he, um, if we can leverage KCP to write a parser to split a cube app um, SVC deployment against two distinct Kubernetes clusters. Yeah. So as I said, like, of course, like KCP is just acting as a proxy and something like the splitter pattern here. Um, so let me, um, yeah, the, the splitter pattern, or if we, if we look at the repo, the splitter looks at 
the deployment, for example, looks at the replica and it has awareness of the clusters that it ingested. So it could separate, for example, a service um, or, or, or a deployment across two different clusters. So that is also possible. Um, there is not 100%, I would say, support for everything now because KCP at this point in time is a prototype, but it's very extensible to match the use case that you just said. All right. Well, let's see. I think that I think that answered his question. And I'm to see if anyone else has any questions here. Give everybody a few minutes. Yeah. All clear here. Okay, it's all clear on all the other ones. I think it, it, what's really interesting to me about this this whole um, use case that you're describing is the applicability to so many other use cases. Um, and you know, I know we're Red Hat and we're all open shifters, and so Hypershift is in our bailiwick. But it it really um, bodes well for I think the concepts between um, KCP um, and and applying them to, across the board, regardless of, of, of what the use case is. So I, the the slide that you had earlier um, with how to get in touch with the KCP community, I think that's probably where you want people to go um, if they have want to continue the conversation, um, the KCP proto prototype one, or is there another place where you would like people to reach out to you um, and, and talk to you about this topic? Yeah, so there are two things that I briefly talked about here, right? If you look at that layered um, architecture, <clears throat> the, the first thing is the, 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 the KCP bit, which is the multi-cluster bit, and that, that you can go and talk to the folks like Dr. Clayton, David, and um, um, and Jason about the use cases. They're discussing that every day, or every week, sorry. Um, and there's another place which is also uh, in, like very interesting, which is the hypershift, which is basically this pattern of decoupling the control plane and the workers, uh, or the management and the workers, and deploying uh, OpenShift um, in, a, in, a, in a more centralized, logically centralized, cheaper, um, uh, uh, faster uh, way. But again, as I said, it, it, it is a complementary like to the existing pattern that we have today. It just gives the users the chance to have that externalized control plane pattern to, to, to save costs and to do all these things. Uh, there's a GitHub repo there. You, you know, contributions are very welcome. We don't have a Slack channel, um, unfortunately, but that's another place that I would try to point people. Yeah. Um, so if you have questions about um, Hypershift itself, also in the Kubernetes Slack, there is an OpenShift-dev and an OpenShift-user channel that um, you can pop into and ask questions as well. So I think this, this, this is really, have you seen this um, pattern at all in production or is it still a theoretical POC kind of thing? So the KCP itself, like KCP is unique in, like if I talk about KCP and Hypershift, KCP itself is very unique in certain aspects, like it tries to do where like you have a minimalistic API server. As I said, like if I look at the cluster, I immediately recognize it's KCP. I don't see this anywhere else. Um, and you have that transparent multi-cluster use case and the stronger multi-tenancy where you can deploy resources and, and you get it translated. Um, there are efforts uh, like federation and so on that tackle that, but not from the same angle. Uh, like KCP was the stronger focus on, on, on multi-cluster and transparency or lossless multi-cluster. Um, on the Hypershift side, as I said, the pattern is not new. There are, there are many providers that give that, separate that control plane and workers. Um, and and, and with, with, with Hypershift, we're bringing that pattern, uh, all the goodies and benefits of that bad pattern, to OpenShift. So you could have OpenShift clusters following that pattern. So I would say it's not new, but it's new with, with OpenShift because you, you, you get the bonus of, of features and then it covers more use cases. And you can then mix and match like protocols in the OSI layer, uh, but with the actual, um, like the OpenShift interconnection uh, model instead. And you have like all these layers and stacks and whatever use case you have, we have the luxury to say, you could pick one block with the other. Um, and that luxury is, 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 is strengthened by the ability to provide these blocks in the first place. Well, if people want to get a hold of you, do you have a, a final slide there with your contact information or anything, or how sh how should we 
follow yeah, up. Yeah, I could I could add that, but I my handle is Dennis Worker. Um, I yeah, so it's. You add that. There we yeah, go. I, I could. Um, so you could you could follow me on Twitter, or you could reach to me on, on Slack. Um, but yeah, I could add it to the to the slide deck and. and... Perfect. All right. Well, um, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to do this today. I know you, you, we're all really busy with the 4.8 release and everything else that's going out the door in the, in the next few months. So it really helps to set the uh, the playing field here for where these use cases fit and how the different pieces and parts of this stack work together. So thank you very much for taking the time today. Um, and I don't see any other questions in the chat, so I'm going to give people a few seconds here before I close it out. Um, and Michael, thank you for your question. If you do, just reach out. If you have other ones, just reach out and um, ask us in, in the Slack and we'll, we'll be hanging out there. Um, or on Twitter, where we also hang out too, but um, it's much better to have a threaded conversation in the, in the Slack channel, I think, these days. So I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. So Adele, I'm gonna give you um, a huge shout out um, on the internets later today and we'll upload this video. And thanks to Chris Short for um, making the production happen today. Um, and we'll call it a wrap. And we'll have you back um, with each new release, I think. And yeah, um, get, sure. you back, get you back yeah. uh, to tell us how, how this how this goes. And I'll, I'll share this with the CP, the KCP prototype channel once it's once it's up too. So because I, I think that'll be sure. a good interesting place for people to give you feedback. So thanks sure. again. Thank you for for hosting. Posting me, it was really fun, and um, I will be back shortly with another topic. <laughs> so, yes. check, me. <laughs> check me soon. All right. All right. Take care, guys. Thank you.